This program is dedicated to those that paid for their lives at the hands of the state. Welcome to another edition of Silent Voices, the only television program where you, the viewer, can have your voice heard on the family court system and DHS system. Today we want to welcome our guest, Chrissy Cox. I want to thank you for being here. Thank you. Welcome to the show, Chrissy. How, um, how did you get started in the system? What exactly happened with your case? In, on May 5th of 2004, a nurse at the Sheboygan Hospital filed a false complaint against me that I was um, under the influence of narcotics. She made a report to Regina Frazier through the Child Protection Service Division, and they came to the hospital and uh, arrested me and took my three children away from me. Oh, they actually, they arrested you? I was handcuffed and taken to jail, yes. Now, did your children witness this? Did they? Yes. Um, at the time, I had a six-month-old, and my other children were eight and 11. The eight-year-old and 11-year-old were definitely old enough to know what was going on. As far as watching me be taken off to jail, they had no idea why. So the CPS worker, when my son, who was 11 at the time, Kyle, asked them what was going on, um, the CPS worker turned to him and said, your mother is a drug addict and you're not safe with her. Wow. That was that. I didn't see him again for 90 days. That kind of surprises me because um, when you deal with the family court system, they tell you you're not to talk to your children about what happens in court or what's going on, not as to badmouth the other parent? I believe that's for alienation purposes. Um, if they allow total communication between parents and children, then they can't alienate your child to coerce and manipulate their thoughts and opinions to reflect the petition that they're holding against the parent. Right. Yeah, that definitely mm -hmm. sounds like the exact opposite of what they should be speaking the workers, to the children in my about. case, um, I'm the only woman in the state of Michigan who resided in the foster care home with my three children. That went on for a year. I was completely compliant with services. Um, I had no drug, no positive drug tests. There was no, they had no complaints against me. And then <coughs> one day completely out of left field, I had a positive drug screen for, I tested positive for methadone, which I hadn't taken. I never seen the drug test. They took my children and placed them with stranger, with a um, unknown foster parent at that time okay. and they were there for six months okay and I just I just want to clarify for our viewing audience you actually um, did have a time that you were taking strong medications for um, physical issues at the very beginning of the case I had a broken back and I was under a doctor's um, orders he monitored my medications he drug screened me he counted my medications to hold me accountable for them um, when Child Protective Services came to remove my children and called me a drug addict, they never counted my medications, they never asked me what medications I was taking, and they never gave me a drug screen, even though I requested one on more than one occasion. Okay. And it's my understanding that you had stopped taking medication on your own before CPS came involved. Is that accurate? Mm -hmm. Three years before Child Protective Services ever entered my life, I had a prescription drug problem. Mm -hmm. I realized that I had a problem when my medicine wasn't working for me anymore, and so I put myself into rehab. I was an adult. I was a mother. I didn't need somebody to tell me 
that I needed rehab. I knew right. that, so I took care of it. So you handled it responsibly and sure. properly for what was best for your children. And for two years, like. I had no problems <coughs> at all. Um, and, and that's, I, I think that's the best that any parent, we all have issues at some point or another, but it sounds like you did what you should have. Well, any parent that takes prescription medications has to be responsible for their medications but at the same time, a Child Protective Service worker does not have a doctor's degree to tell you what you should or should not be taking. And little did I know, when CPS became, it, it got involved in my life, I personally stopped taking my medication, which I later found out could have been, had very yeah. serious side effects for me. So right. I don't recommend anybody else just up and stop their medications for any purpose without a doctor's. Yes, Assistance. As, as with any medication, a lot of them have to, you have to titrate them down to exactly. um, be safe. Um, so what happened at that point? Um, you, were in, you were in the foster care with your children, then they moved them to another foster care home, which My you children were, were placed in a licensed, a state licensed foster care home with two people I had never met. Um, my son was treated wonderfully in the foster home. Great. My eight-year-old daughter was told that she was fat, lazy. She, um, they kept meals from her to help her with her weight problem. My, uh, let's see, my youngest daughter was six months when this started, so she was about 18 months when she was put, placed with strangers. During her time at the state-licensed foster home, my youngest daughter received a diaper rash so severe that the blood was literally leaking through her diaper, and I was forced to return her to the people that were hurting her. Wow. Um, I just want to clarify, your daughter, um, Madison, was eight years old at the time? Yes. And just to back up a little bit, because I heard something that's very interesting here, they told her that she had a weight issue at eight years old? Actually, what they said to her was, <clears throat> their exact words were, if you weren't so lazy, you wouldn't be so fat. While my children lived in the foster home, they were required to work in the garden for upwards of six to eight hours a day. They had to haul and stack wood for however, until the foster parents told them they could stop. That's how they earned their, mood, their, their food. If they didn't get their work done, they were just sent to their room. Now, if I, as a parent, would have punished my children in such a fashion, that would have opened the door to Child Protective Services coming in. Right. However, since Child Protective Services said that this home was okay, they don't have accountability to, te to treat your children with kindness, or dignity, or respect. Your children are a dollar, right. a means to an end. <clears throat> so, at this point in time, Madison is your daughter's name. She's eight years old and she's being treated for being overweight. Now, did her regular pediatrician diagnose her with obesity? Absolutely not. Uh, my daughter Madison was above tall and actually underweight, statistically speaking. Mm -hmm. um, no, and because, of, because they used food as a way to punish and control my children, now my daughter at 18 has severe anxiety issues when it comes to food. She has anxiety issues for being around strangers. What Child Protective Services doesn't seem to realize or understand is that the actions that they take today have reactions on the children that we raise for tomorrow. Yeah, absolutely. So for every negative influence that they have in their life now that's coming from an authority figure, a CPS worker, a foster care worker, mm -hmm. it alters a child's opinion and their views on authority, what is authority, accountability, respect, it, it totally undoes everything that a good mother does. Right, right. That, and I can't, um, I can't think of any situation in which it would be okay to tell an eight-year-old child, whether it be a boy or a girl, that they're overweight and restrict their food. Um, some children end up being really tall and they thicken up before that comes. That's a natural, um, it's natural growth. For it is, them. and some children who are picked on 
and bullied about their weight will then turn to food as a comfort and then end up overeating and making yes. themselves obese. Yep. And so there's no, there's no good way. A, a person's weight is their weight. The Lord makes each one of us different just the way he wants us. Right. It's only society and the media that tells us what is too big or too small. Right. And I worked in the mental health field and I just, I've never seen an issue or any child that it would be okay to tell them they're overweight and restrict food in while they're still growing. Um, what, what do you suppose the reason was that your son was not abused in foster care, but your daughter's between the diaper rash of your um, baby and your daughter? I think a lot of it was because th there's a few different things. First off, the foster mother didn't like my daughters, but the foster father really enjoyed taking my son hunting. Okay. But the biggest thing that I think that protected my son was the fact that he was 11 and not afraid to tell anybody anything. So okay. had they mistreated so he was him, outspoken. he would have said something. He would have made sure that somebody knew he was being mistreated. But my daughter, who was eight and automatically bullied about her food, was told right out of the gate by the actions of everybody else that she couldn't speak up. Right. So they kept her alienated and quiet and kept him happy and quiet. Right. Either way, they still bought their silence. Another thing that I've been looking into and researching lately is the fact that, um, and I'm not sure if this pertains to your situation, but something that I've noticed in society is that we tend to, as a society, say boys will be boys, yet we're harder on our girls and expect them to be ladylike and soft-spoken. And this is an issue that I personally see that I've we have I've always with taught my children, children, whether it be my son or my daughters, if you don't stand up for something you know is wrong, you cannot get upset when somebody else doesn't stand up, but you also can't pave the way for others to stand up. Absolutely, So yes. I've never taught my children to be quiet about anything, especially if it makes them uncomfortable. Yeah. The CPS worker said to me <coughs> that I had the most well-behaved, well-mannered, polite children she had ever removed from a home. Wow. I see it as if I could raise those well-mannered, behaved children how bad of a parent was I? Did I deserve to be put on the child abuse registry? Although I was never convicted of a crime. Right. I was never charged with abuse or neglect, but I'm on the child abuse registry. This hinders me from, from volunteering with my 11 year old in her classroom, going on to field trips. Because yeah. of the injustices that I found on my own and because of what me and my children have suffered as a family and individuals, I have dedicated my life to advocating for parents who cannot stand or do not know how to stand up for, their, for themselves and their rights. Right. But as a citizen of the United States of America, I am fed up. I have had it to my lid of people with authority not having accountability. You cannot give somebody power without accountability and expect them to do only good things with it. Right. And I will not stop until something changes in the system to hold workers accountable for their mistakes, to hold prosecutors accountable, and to stop malicious false allegations from flooding the central registry. Yes, and that's, that's what we found in, in doing mm -hmm. this type of work is that not all parents can stand up for themselves um, for fear of retaliation sometimes. It is scary. Or when somebody's holding your children <clears throat> as hostage, we'll say, to make you um, adhere to their service plan and to benefit from their service plan. Every parent is willing to do anything to prove that mm -hmm. they're not guilty of child abuse or neglect. Right. And by doing that, by opening that up and allowing that, you're actually opening the door for them to attack you even harder. Yes. This is the one system where you're guilty until proven innocent. Yeah. And the burden of proof is on the parent not on the prosecutor. Yes, and, and along with that, if, if you do not know what your rights are in the system, you don't have any, they will, so, you will, you'll lose it all. Every um, parent in the state of Michigan needs to know that you have Michigan constitutional rights. You have federal constitutional rights, and if you do not know what those rights are, you have no way to stand yeah. up for them. 
absolutely. Now, something interesting about your daughter, Madison. Um, now, she was put on a weight loss diet, which in my opinion should have never happened, but she was put on that and dealing with the with people calling her overweight, her foster parents. Um, how did she respond? What did she do in response to this that, that really stuck out to you? She internalized her pain and became a perfectionist. She is so hard on herself that she doesn't know how to handle getting a B on a paper. She has severe anxiety. Her stress levels are always high. She's always nervous. And I know why it is. It, mm -hmm. it, it was done by the state of Michigan and their lack of accountability has caused my daughter to now suffer, who knows, maybe for the rest of her life with anxiety disorders and perfectionist disorders and constantly feeling like she has to do more to be good enough. Right, and she did not have these issues before with no, um, being really No, she was really not medicated. Herself. Now she takes Xanax. She's never been on medicines before, ever until this happened. Wow. I, you know, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of issues that come with taking medications and when children are damaged to the point where they have to have them to function, it can be really dangerous in the long run for them to... It takes away from their self-worth because yes. at such a tender young age, they, I mean, to have to need a pharmaceutical or any kind of a medication to deal with every single day problems yeah. that you and I have, uh, have learned to deal with without medication, that's not an option for her. Right. Yeah, but some, some adults have issues, you know, dealing with trauma response too, let alone, you know, I, children. I feel that many CPS workers have serious um, <coughs> issues, and I, I, I have to tend to wonder if some of them are undiagnosed. And that's one of the things that we here at um, Silent Voices support would be judges, social workers, um, gals, CASA workers, having them, having them screened for mental health issues and also having proper training in domestic violence in, um, you know, trauma responses well, with children. Well, the state of Michigan needs to take a moment to seriously consider doing background checks. Uh, Emmett County right now, Gabriel Green, it was a, C, was a foster worker, a CPS worker in Emmett County. He's just now charged with 15 counts of sex coercion and using drugs on his parents and children to make them listen to him. This and man this is, is the county that you had, was that a, you were dealing with? Yes, in okay. Emmett County. And this is a current, this happened uh, two months ago. He was arrested. Wow. Where was his background check? <clears throat> Where was his p periodic psychological evaluations? That the workers claim that these are done, but there's no proof. Right. And just wanted to let you, the viewers, know that um, much of the time these these workers that are harming children or do harm children in the system are immune to prosecution. Um, they rubber stamp papers and there's no accountability, as you said. Um, and that creates, a, that creates a really big problem when you're dealing with children who can have lifelong issues from what they've been put through. Um, it would seem reasonable that now your children would have um, traumatic responses as well as anxiety, separation anxiety. Is that something that you've noticed since they've been returned to your care? <laughs> Excuse me, since they've been returned to my care, I've noticed many things. Um, a lot of workers think that removing a baby or a child under the age of 12 months to remove them from their family and then later give them back does not cause ongoing behavioral issues or psychological issues with the child. I once heard a worker say, children bounce back. Well, yeah. my um, daughter, who's now 11, was six months old in 2004, and her bouncing back has actually turned into uncontrollable rage disorder. So although she was proverbial, and young and in diapers when this happened, her, so, her psychological well-being has been forever altered by this. Right, that's, that's, that's really heartbreaking. I'm so sorry that you have to, that you've had to deal with this and your children, no, no child deserves that. Um, but she did have the, 
um, the issue with the severe diaper rash. And yes, she is the one that has. She'll be for. She'll be scarred forever. Um, she's 11 years old. We have to buy um, boy cut bathing suits because her diaper rash scars show in regular bathing suits. So now there comes the self conscious, low self esteem, low self worth which as a mother raising a daughter, those are the things that I want to bring up in her. Absolutely, yeah. But it's taken away so easily. So these are permanent scars that She is permanently scarred. They, she will have them forever. And I imagine, you know, in working in the mental health field, there's some of these emotional scars are just as bad, if not worse, as you're finding out trying to help your children survive. The physical and scars are one thing, but trying to repair the psyche of a child is, I'm not trained in that. I, I, right. I've never been to school for that. I just pray that the Lord gives me the knowledge and the wisdom that I need to do what is best for her. Right. Now, I wanted to talk about your, your daughter. Um, you know, I'm not going to say her name because she is 18 years old. Thank you. And I want to kind of protect her from that. But what is going on with her right now that you're finding? What's, what is an issue that you're dealing with with her? Her biggest issue, besides her need to constantly be perfect, is, you know, she's in college now, so she's living in the dorms, and it's dealing with authority. Now that I'm not there to protect her from that authority, Mm -hmm. She has to find a way to trust her superiors, right. even though in the past that's proven to be very detrimental to her person. She has severe high anxiety disorders, mm -hmm. and it all stems from Child Protective Services removing her. And what is her social life like? She has no right social now? life. She doesn't really go out, she doesn't have a lot of friends, she doesn't socialize in big groups because she has panic attacks. Um, she keeps two or three very close friends, and um, and that's it. How, what about her dating life? There, at what? There, no dating life. She has no trust for boys, and I think that comes from um, one of the <coughs> beginning workers, Steve Tallarico. In our case, in 2004, told my daughter that she was only going to be gone for two or three days, and then she'd come right back home, and that turned into 18 months. So. Her, her ability to trust authority is gone. Right, and understandably so. That would be tough on anybody, let alone a child. I don't child. know how I would handle it as an adult. If somebody took me away from my family today right. and put me with people I didn't know, I don't know that at my age I could handle it. Right. And yet she was expected to handle it without help at eight years old. Okay, I just, I, I really quick, I wanted to touch on what your daughter, again, I'm not gonna name her because she is 18, um, what is she doing that's right? What is she doing that, that you feel is going to be helpful to other people and herself? She has learned how to set goals. She has learned how to overcome one of the biggest obstacles that any family faces. And she does it with the grace and style of an angel. She has great perseverance and she is wonderful relentlessness. She's so intelligent. And she's now in school, in college, to learn a way to change systems and laws faster to protect children. Okay, and it's my understanding she's starting a support group? She has started a support group for survivors of foster families, children, and pretty much the entire foster area. If you've been a foster child or had were lived with foster children or were a victim of the state, then right. this is a group where you can go and know that your mom and dad weren't the only ones. You're not the only child. Yeah. But being an 18 year old now, she has the ability to now stop and help other people come from where she's already gone through. Right. That's, you know, despite the issues that she's having, it sounds like she's really dealing with this in a healthy way. And as healthy as she can. I'm yeah. sure there are unhealthy aspects of it, but. Well, <laughs> being able to reach out to others and understand that she's not the only one that survived that is really, that speaks volumes because a lot of children are they, they tend to, if they've been in any kind of abuse, they start to lack empathy. Well, and so do parents. I worry about the empathy of families in general. Parents right. that have to go through the system. How do you come out of the system and not be so scarred and so hateful and full of anger that you don't spend the rest of your life upset? 
Yeah. Everybody has to learn how to heal from being a victim of false allegations and having your family and your life destroyed on a whim. Right. Well, I just wanted to say on behalf of Dennis and myself, thank you so much for thank coming you. on the show. And we appreciate, you know, you telling your children's and your story. And we will continue to hope that your daughter keeps blazing a path for other children that can, you know, um, turn it around and use their experience to help other people. That's the only positive thing you can do with it. Yes. If you would like to be a guest on Silent Voices, contact us at miparentalrights at gmail.com. That's miparentalrights at gmail.com. We want to thank you, the viewers, for watching our show today. We will be on next week, same time, same channel. Um, we thank you, Christy, for being on the show and telling your story, and we will, we will meet you back here next time.